do I go from having tender documents with the tender response that a tender has now submitted after the closing date and get to a completed contract? Often lawyers just assume that the steps in between are somehow going to magically happen and often contracts professionals don't know what to do to get to that point in time. So let me spell it out for you. It helps to map it out on paper and write a list of which documents are contained in the tender response and which of those documents need to actually go into the contract documents. The challenge is unless a contract actually says that a particular document is included in the contract, just by having a document over here in the tender response doesn't automatically make it become part of the contract. So you have to take positive steps and talk with your lawyer and work out how to make that happen. One of the key things I'm often asked is, how do I get the specification to become part of the contract? So keep in mind, specification can be called a statement of requirements, it can be called a scope of works, it can be called a principles project requirements. Whatever name it is, it's the document that went out with the tender package and it set out your requirements as the client for the project. That document needs to become a contract document and the draft contract already no doubt talks about specification or statement of requirements or scope of work or, or whatever it is that you need to have uh, in the actual contract. But to get from point A to point B is often the challenge. So what do you do? First off, I never recommend that you actually just pick up a specification or a statement of requirements and put it over here in the contract, voila, it's a contract document. That doesn't work because usually specifications and statements of requirements are drafted with the tender in mind. So the language they use is talking about tenderers and it's talking about draft contract and it's talking about the project that's maybe going to happen if approvals are given in the future for that project. When you've got a contract, you need to actually use language that talks about the project as taking place right now. So the contract governs the project as it's occurring. And that concept really needs to be reflected in the specification or statement of requirements documents. After the tender responses have come in, they've been assessed, a successful tenderer has been uh, appointed, what you need to do then is read that specification or statement of requirements. And in your mind, you need to translate, what do I need to now amend in this document so that it becomes present tense, talking about the current project with the approvals having already been given. You then need to amend that document or have your lawyers help you amend that document so that it can become a self-contained document in the contract and, and a standalone document in the contract. So that's what you do for the statement of requirements. What do you then do for the tenders, qualifications or departures where they've actually put in a schedule and said, we ask for these amendments to the terms of the contract or we make various assumptions which we want to actually include uh, in the contract documents. What you need to do then is work with your lawyer to pull out and tease out the particular amendments that are going to be required to the contract documents so that you can then reflect what was agreed between the parties during the tender negotiation phase. So as an example, if the tenderer submitted a liquidated damages amount of $1,500 per day and you agreed in the end that the liquidated damages amount would be $2,000 a day, that needs to go in the contract. If in their departures, the tenderer says, we assume that we will get extensions of time for rock found under the surface of the ground, you need to then ask yourself, and this is more one for the lawyers, you need to ask yourself, what amendment do I need to make to the terms of the contract to make it in practice so that they will get an extension of time if rocks are found? Now, if you're talking construction concepts and you're talking with your lawyer, it's talking about latent conditions and extensions of time. So you would go to that clause and you would actually amend that clause to reflect the agreement that you had with the contractor. This is often a big issue for contractors because they often don't follow up with their assumptions in contracts and they may actually end up not realising that the client didn't include their assumptions in the actual contract document. 
So if you're a contractor, you need to actually be really careful about your qualifications and your assumptions and make sure they have been captured over in the contract document. So coming up next, I'm going to tell you one thing that clients can do, whether it's their lawyers or their contracts professionals, to make sure they have a really good contract after the tender process occurs. In the meantime, though, I want you to subscribe so you get all my future videos and also click the like button so that you share the contracting love. One thing that the client can do to make sure they have a really good contract document is to ensure that every single document that is required to be part of the contract is actually together with the other documents in the contract in the right order. And for really large complex projects, that actually may include requiring a whole list of referred documents or, or referenced documents to be inserted in a particular schedule in the contract. It's really important when you're drafting your contract and getting it ready for execution that you go through and you make sure that all the documents that are meant to be part of the contract have actually been linked up in some way or referenced in some way or particular qualifications and departures that need to be incorporated in the contract have actually been incorporated. It often helps to have a running list when you're actually doing the drafting or as contracts professionals when you're supervising the drafting and that running list can help you check off and make sure everything has been done that has been agreed with the contractor. I've found that that's one of the ways you can have a really good start of the project and of the contract by the contractor feeling that their departures and qualifications have been listened to and by making sure that you actually start off with a contract that does reflect what the parties have actually agreed. If you have any comments or questions, put them in the comments below. So make sure you subscribe and like and watch the next video that's showing up in the corner.